Hello and welcome to the 78th annual Cold Spring Harbor Symposium, which this year is on the theme of immunity and tolerance. My name's John Ingalls. I'm the executive director and publisher of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press. And it's my pleasure to introduce our guest this afternoon, who is Professor Ruslan Metsitov from Yale. Um, Ruslan, welcome back to the lab. I know you've just told me you've been here many times, but perhaps Thank not you. under these circumstances. Thank you. Great to be here. Um, Ruslan is uh, an extremely distinguished member of the uh, immunology research community. He's a Howard Hughes investigator. He's a member of the National Academy and the winner of numerous prizes, including the 2011 Shaw Prize and most recently the inaugural Lurie Prize. Um, Ruslan, you were born in uh, Uzbekistan, in, in Tashkent, and That's you right. did your undergraduate studies there, and then you went to Moscow to pursue a PhD in biochemistry. That's right. Now, I happen to know there's a wonderful story about how you got from there to Yale, and I'd love yeah. you to, to tell that story, and I'll tell you why after you've told it. Okay. <laughs> well, the story was that um, right around the time when I started my PhD studies in Moscow, which was in, uh, in the fall of 1990, that was when the um, Soviet Union basically uh, went through the first crisis when it started separating into different countries and there was the first economic and political crisis yeah. and so that basically made any kind of experimental research almost impossible and uh, and that uh, sort of forced me to um, spend most of my time uh, reading and thinking and um, and uh, it just so happened at the time I wasn't really interested in immunology mm. uh, in fact I read the first uh, textbook on immunology around that time and thought this is the most boring <laughs> and incomprehensible. You don't have to tell us yeah. which, which textbook <laughs> that was. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they all were similar at the time. <laughs> and I thought it was completely incomprehensible and uh, uh, strange science. And uh, But I was interested in some aspects of, uh, there was something clearly that there was uh, something behind that that was uh, probably would explain all that mess and uh, provide some nice simple uh, logic to it. And around that time, I uh, ran into the proceedings of the 1989 Cold Spring Harbor uh, Symposium on Immunity. And uh, the first um, article, which I still remember, pages 1 through 13, <laughs> uh, were by Charles Janeway, uh, which was about uh, uh, the theory of uh, pattern recognition and how innate immune sensing of infection can instruct adaptive immunity. And I thought that that really, th that's the kind of uh, simple logic that I, yeah. I, I thought would exist that would explain it. And, that and this was that his got articulation of the distinction between innate immunity and adaptive immunity. And, and that plus uh, his like really visionary uh, ideas about how innate immune recognition, how different it is in principle, and how, uh, what sort of mechanisms it would use to detect microbes and how that would then translate into activation of adaptive immunity without knowing any of the details that we currently know right. that fill in all sure. these uh, gaps. And, uh, and, and that was uh, a tipping point for me. It was, I, I just got uh, immediately hooked on the, on the beauty of that concept and that's what made me want to pursue studies of immunology but specifically with Janeway because I thought uh, at the time, that would be the only place I would want to work if I were to study immunology. Mm. And so I contacted him uh, from Moscow, and uh, and that led to some exchanges of emails, and then uh, ultimately uh, he invited me to join to join his lab. Right, and you did that via USD, US, UCSD, UCSD with the fellowship. Yeah. With, uh, at that Dick time, Dutton. I was interested in molecular evolution, so I had a fellowship uh, with actually with Ross Doolittle, who is mm. uh, one of the pioneers in uh, protein evolution. And while I was in Ross's lab, uh, he introduced me to Dick Dutton, and I had a one conversation with him. I remember in the afternoon uh, when he asked me what I wanted to do next, then I said. What I really want to do is to go to Charles Janeway's lab, but I don't think it's possible. I have no credentials, I have no right. CV, I have, uh, I'm basically... Uh, and I think you've said somewhere that you'd not done experiments. And I have never done experiments, yeah, yeah, yeah. because uh, I couldn't. And, and so what Dick Dutton did, he made a phone call to Charlie, and the next morning Charlie emailed me that I can join his lab. Yes. Yeah. So that was a very exciting day. 
Well, I think that's a, that's a terrific story in so many ways. And, and uh, the reason I like it so much is that I, too, discovered immunology through the red-bound volumes of uh -huh. the Cold Spring Harbor Symposium as, as an undergraduate. And then later, I got the chance to start the journal Immunology Today, and uh -huh. I was the founding editor. Yeah, and yeah. Charlie helped me with that. I see. So I knew him. He was a wonderful guy. And then when I came to Cold Spring Harbor, the, fi the first thing Jim asked me to do was organize the 1989 symposium. Oh, right. So Charlie, of course, was yeah. on the agenda. Yeah. And he, he presented and talked, of course, as he always does. And uh, did, and um, he uh, then at the end, he said he had an article that he wanted to write for yeah. the symposium. And it, w it didn't fit into the format. Uh -huh. So I was a bit stuck, you know, I was the guardian of this long tradition yeah. of the symposium, but we didn't have hypotheses of right. quite that kind. But yeah. I thought since it was Charlie, yeah. we should have it. So we put it in as an introduction. Of course, yeah. it wasn't an introduction at all, it right. was a hypothesis. Yeah. Yeah. So I sort of feel as though yeah. at that moment, I had your future in the palm of my hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but that uh, <laughs> Charlie was such a, a great, person and yeah. so s it was so sad that he died so young yeah. and I gather you're organizing a symposium in his memory uh, yes really yes soon. we are and that would uh, mark his uh, uh, ten, 10 years anniversary of his yeah. uh, passing away right yeah. well um, we should talk a bit about your science and okay. uh, uh, your lab is presenting a whole range of things at the, at, at the symposium I mean about um, interleukin receptors about um, uh, the allergic response, um, about T cell regulation um, and uh, dendritic cells, but um, we can't cover all of that. Yeah. You, you are talking, I, I think, very interestingly, uh, judged from the abstract, about macrophage, resident macrophages and their role in mm -hmm. controlling inflammation and tissue homeostasis. Yes. So Tell us about that. So, uh, m my interest uh, in the last year or so shifted towards uh, this question of fundamental biology of inflammation. And inflammation has a long history, but um, it's kind of a skewed uh, uh, history because it's been primarily a focus of interest uh, from the disease perspective. And, however, uh, about 100 years ago when uh, Eli Mechnikov uh, developed his theory of immunity, uh, he actually proposed for, for the first time that inflammation has also a very important physiological role mm. in maintaining what he called harmony, but in modern terms it's homeostasis. And, and those ideas basically uh, are 100 years old mm. and, uh, and uh, it, it they haven't really been advance much in that direction. There's been a lot of details learned about inflammation, of course. But what I'm really interested in now is in trying to see how uh, the inflammation biology can be integrated back with physiology. Uh -huh. And I think there's a great deal we can learn about uh, the connections between the two aspects of, uh, of human biology and uh, not only the learn not only about the role of inflammation in in our defenses from a variety of uh, noxious conditions, including not, ju not only infection, but also the role of inflammation in uh, normal physiology and homeostasis. And these aspects are surprisingly poorly understood, actually, in part because, like in many fields, uh, inflammation became sort of a field of its own, got segregated from other fields yes. from physiology. Yes. yes, indeed. For a long time, was really only a focus of pathology. And, uh, but eventually they need to be reintegrated. And inflammation also became a very fragmented field. It's, uh, there are, uh, at one point I looked, there were something like several thousand review articles about inflammation, mm -hmm. but each one of them was in a very, very specific mm -hmm. aspect. Mm -hmm. right? So what we're interested in now is uh, in working towards maybe some more general concepts of inflammation and particularly by integrating them with, uh, uh, with physiology. I mean, a lot of the approach to inflammation, of course, comes from a, uh, a, a, a fundamentally from a, a therapeutic point of view that, that people are interested in ways of damping it down once it right. has yeah. uh, become um, acute. But right. I, your um, interest is in, in what you call chronic inflammation. And, and could you explain how you see that process uh, working and, and how yeah. that relates to homeostasis? Well, chronic, so the difference between 
acute and chronic inflammation is that um, it's not only in their duration one is acute the other is prolonged but uh, but the goal of acute inflammation is to get rid of the insult that caused the, in the response whether it's infection or injury or yes. anything else um, the the purpose of chronic inflammation is to adapt to the presence of the insult especially if insult cannot be uh, eliminated like in the case of chronic infections or any other problem mm. that is persistent and cannot be uh, eliminated that leads to changes in the organism that adapt to live with the insult. And, and that always happens at the cost to normal physiological functions, to normal uh, homeostatic settings of the, of the variety of systems. And that's what leads to illnesses of associated with chronic inflammation. Right. What we, the classical view of the pathological aspect of inflammation has to do with the uh, idea that inflammatory response can cause collateral damage and uh, and that's the underlying reason for pathological uh, potential of inflammation this is true but that's only true in the extreme case mm -hmm. in much more general case uh, any inflammatory response happens at the cost to normal physiological right. function even if it is not associated with the birth tissue damage for example it still happens at the cost mm -hmm. and when it becomes chronic in particular these costs accumulate and they result in this uh, di uh, chronic diseases that are basically all of them are inflammatory. They all have an inflammatory so component. So are you, are you referring to uh, say autoimmune diseases or something like allergy for example? Uh, uh, or so it, it applies to uh, to those diseases but it applies to any other modern human disease like coronary including artery. metabolic diseases, um, uh, yeah, okay. neurodegenerative diseases, even cancer, all these diseases uh, uh, are inflammatory in the sense that they have inflammatory component. Inflammation is not necessarily causative, but at least it, it's, uh, it's involved in perpetuating these disease states. And these aspects of uh, inflammation, how it promotes these diseases or uh, maintains the, uh, promotes progression of these diseases is, is what is uh, still poorly understood. And that's something that we are interested in. But we're interested in understanding it as a, as a deviation from normal. So we want yes. to understand the normal counterpart first, and then to see how that normal deviates to cause uh, uh, a pathological state. And are you interested in approaching it from a therapeutic perspective? Uh, so therapeutic, I am. But therapeutic perspective, again, uh, for me, is uh, not the starting point. Yeah. And the reason, again, is because I, uh, th there are basically two types of diseases. There are diseases that are caused by, uh, uh, by a deviation from normal. Some, when there is a normal process, it becomes exaggerated, and then you have a disease. Yeah. So anything that's regulated can be dysregulated, and there are these kinds of diseases. And there are other processes that are not regulated, they're fixed, and, and these, these can only be broken. So uh, these processes only have genetic basis for diseases. So we want to understand what the normal counterpart is first. Uh, and then by knowing what's normal counterpart and which aspects can be dysregulated, exaggerated, mm. become chronic, mm. from there to understand pathology, right. but not the other way around. Yeah. Because I think that's more natural way to understand the underlying mm -hmm. basis mm -hmm. of diseases. Mm -hmm. And, and you're obviously doing this in animal models, um, largely. We're doing it in animal models, but I'm, uh, I'm very interested in the, in the subject of evolutionary medicine, mm. uh, which is uh, basically a field of science that tries to explain evolutionary causes for various human diseases. So humans are uniquely vulnerable to certain diseases. Uh, humans live in a very unique environment, which we created ourselves, and that environment very much mismatches with our uh, genetics yeah, and yeah. with our biology which was shaped in very different conditions and that creates certain types of vulnerabilities in the in in a human organism and that's what basically explains the spectrum of mm. modern diseases mm. so modern diseases are very dis different from diseases we had even 100 years ago allergy asthma yes. were very rare 100 years ago and uh, many metabolic diseases were much more rare even 30 years ago. So, so there is this mismatch between human biology and environment that explains this modern spectra of human diseases. And much of it has to do with, uh, um, with the uh, inappropriate functioning of systems like inflammatory or immune systems that have very high cost. Mm. 
they have high cost in terms of what I just said, that yes. they always occur at the expense of normal functions. Right. And that's what really contributes to this high prevalence of inflammatory chronic disease in, in, uh, in, civilized, uh, in industrialized countries. And that's regardless of genetic background? So, uh, so genetic background is something that can uh, increase or decrease uh, mm. susceptibility. Uh, again, processes that are regulated, they can be, uh, these are the processes where you see the greatest degree of genetic variability. Uh, and the reason you see that is because the genetic variability allows for better adaptation to particular habitats, niches, and so on. And, uh, and, and, and they typically had provided some advantage at some point in a particular environment, and yeah. once environment right. changed, they are the ones that increase predisposition. So the, there is always genetic component to that in that sense. But, these, but, the, but uh, when disease incidence uh, goes up by 200% in 30 years, that's clearly uh, there is an environmental impact. And, and that largely has to do with uh, aspects of the environment that are, we created ourselves yeah that uh, we are not, uh, we did not evolve to adapt to. I mean, this is a, a huge and fascinating subject, but we yeah. unfortunately yeah. don't have much more time. But yeah. I mean, would you like to speculate about what some of those environmental triggers might be? Well, uh, there, are m there are m many of them are obvious in, in, in general. So we have a very uh, unnatural, for example, diet. diet. Uh, yes. We yeah. live in uh, crowded environments, which is unnatural to humans. We have electricity and reactor light, so it's, it's a very unnatural circadian mm. rhythm. Mm. Uh, so these are just a few examples of the, and of course we drive cars uh, and we don't walk and run around um, for the most part. So these are the aspects of the environment that are natural, that are obviously unnatural. Yes. Uh, and also we use uh, hygiene products uh, and we use uh, antibiotics and vaccinations. These provide huge medical benefit benefits in, yeah. in but there are eliminating yeah they eliminate yeah. Uh, they eliminate uh, mortality from infectious diseases uh, the uh, but but the excessive use of for example hygiene products uh, can also alter some aspects of a normal exposure to microbes that can in turn mm. potentially mm. predispose to some inflammatory diseases I can't resist ending with a question about how do you deal with this in your personal life then? I mean, <laughs> are there things that you, you know, steer clear of because of your um, uh, uh, instincts about these things? Well, my, uh, so there are certain things about modern environment that we wouldn't want to change. Again, we wouldn't want to change uh, Vac hygiene, vaccinations, vaccinations mm -hmm. antibiotics. These, these things save lives. Uh, you wouldn't want to increase risk of dying as a baby just so that you don't develop uh, obesity when you're 60. Yes. Right? Yes. So this is, this is obvious, that there are certain things we don't want to change. And because we don't want to change them, we will have to adapt in some other way. We will have to figure out other ways to eliminate problems that could be associated mm -hmm. with it. But there are other aspects of the environment that we really do need to change. And unfortunately, the, the ones that are most difficult to change are the ones that have a very strong economic or political uh, underlying mm, reasons mm. like food so industries. Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah. Food yeah. industry is probably the most obvious example of mm. unhealthy and natural environment driven by profits of uh, big food companies, right. which are not concerned with uh, mm -hmm. long term mm -hmm. metabolic mm -hmm. effects and so forth. Mm -hmm. So these are the kinds of things that everyone can control by avoiding certain types of un unhealthy, uh, unhealthy diets. And uh, this may sound the problem with the diets, of course, this is uh, an overuse and over abused field, and there are millions of books about what's healthy yes. and what's unhealthy, and that kind of makes it more complicated to get the point across. Right. Uh, but that's one aspect of the uh, environment that uh, everyone can control, and it's actually tremendously unhealthy what current modern like we uh, do. Yes. diets yes, are. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well. There are so many other things we could talk about, but I think we've run out of time. Ruslan, thank okay. you very much indeed. Thank it's you been very fascinating much, talking thank to you. you. Thanks for doing this.